Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of The Hub Podcast, sponsored by Capital Workspaces. Today, we have a very special guest that we had such a great conversation prior to this taping, Alex Caller at Bumblebee Pediatrics. How are you, Alex? I'm doing awesome. Thanks oh, so much for oh having me. Oh my God, I know you're doing awesome. We had a great conversation. Thank you so much. And to, and to jump off, um, bumblebeepediatrics.com is where you can find out all the information about Alex's business and the services that they provide. So, okay, great. Where are you from, Alex? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, originally. Okay. And what did you? why did you decide to come to this area? And were you educated in Pennsylvania as well? Mm-hmm. Born in Pennsylvania, educated in Pennsylvania. I ended up going to Penn State for undergraduate. Okay. And then when I was looking at graduate schools, I went all over the place. I kind of gave myself a six or eight hour radius around Pittsburgh and ended up at the University of Pittsburgh because at the time, you know, they were they were top 10. I thought, okay, fine. I'll stick around a little bit. Gotcha. Kind of okay. begrudgingly. Okay. I have a girlfriend that went to Penn State as well. And maybe years ago when my children were very small, um, Penn State used to hold, and I'm not sure if you know about the Trash to Treasure at Beaver Stadium. Mm-hmm. When all you guys used to go home for, I guess, spring or whatever vacation, and couldn't take everything home. They used to take everything you guys had and sell it at Beaver Stadium. So underneath the stadium, underneath the bleachers, you can go there and buy everything like the ironing boards and yeah. clothing. And oh, I used to come home with bags. So much stuff. stuff. I can only imagine. So, oh my god, for yeah. my children. So yeah. I, att- I I attended that event and I loved it. I'm not. Sure. Do you know? Have you? Well, do you know if that's still going on? Or I, you were- wasn't there in okay. between? You know, 2009 and 20. 13 when okay. I graduated, yeah. Okay, okay. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I love but that. But it is really cool. Very sustainable. Mm-hmm. Very. I love the idea behind that. Okay, so we're going to jump right into Bumblebee Pediatrics. Share with me your education and why you chose this line of career. I really had no idea what I wanted to do at first. Okay. I thought, you know, maybe I want to do something where I'm helping people. So I looked into education and then as I was taking these education classes, freshman year, sophomore year, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a whole systemic problem. I don't want to get to this. This is way too much. Um, It's a lot of work and very little pay and very little respect from people outside that education community who know what go into it. So then I thought, okay, let's look at healthcare. And I walked into that chem class, chem 101, you know, 9 a.m. on a Friday or whatever, walked in and out came this very old professor wheeling out one of those old school overhead projectors. Yeah. And he was talking so slowly and with such a thick accent, I thought, you know what? Whatever my degree is, it will not need this class. <laughs> <laughs> not, I will not make it let's, through this. Let's swipe left. Let's swipe yeah. right. <laughs> so I just walked right out and I thought, whatever it's going to be, it's not this. Okay. Um, but I still really, really liked that medical background. I My family has always worked either alongside medicine or within medicine. Really? So. Yeah, my um, stepfather's a, a pathologist. Um, my mom's always worked uh, adjacent to healthcare, running different departments within a, a healthcare school program. And my dad's a mental health therapist. There's always been oh, wow. some aspect of health and education in my life. So this was a pretty easy uh, find once I got started, but I wasn't sure which direction to go. So then I thought, well, maybe, you know, I really like working with people. I'm going to do business. Let's go to business. Okay. So loved my management classes because it was all about how to work well with people. It's all about how to manage other people to accomplish goals. I get to that econ class. Same thing as chem. This gotcha. is not working for That's me. This for is me. not for me, right? Long story short, I had a friend say, you should check out speech pathology. It kind of mixes all those things together. I thought, oh. oh, I've never really heard of this. I never, you know, attended speech. A lot of times in my field, you'll find someone who says, ah, I, you know, I, I went there. My cousin went there. My aunt's a speech pathologist, my uncle, whatever. Not me. But I had okay. never heard of it before. <laughs> um, ended up taking classes and thought, this is awesome. It combines all of those things. You know, we're this really diverse kind of population of clinicians because it's a broad field. There's major areas. There's swallowing. There's neuro stuff. There's, you know, pediatric feeding things. There's language disorders. And then there's the traditional speech sounds that people think of. It's a really broad field. Okay. And so you can kind of decide which way do you want to go in it, right? What is the direction that you want to go? Um, And eventually, whenever I get to graduate school, 
I thought, you know what, I really love these complex kiddos. I really like to, the puzzle piece of it. Yes. And any kind of role where I can do longer-term relationships. So that acute care, in and out, that okay. kind of relationship yes. wasn't for me. It was fine. I understand the, the draw. It's You're really just digging, pace. digging, trying to find your niche. But I'm trying to find the niche, and I find these complex kids. So I think um, – genetic anomalies, think um, extreme versions of autism, things like that. And that was my jam. I thought this is for me. And I was looking at where I would do my clinical fellowship. So after graduate school, we go do a clinical fellowship for nine months, and then you earn your your C's, your certificate of clinical competence from um, ASHA, which is our national board. And then when I was looking at places, there's really only one or two in Pittsburgh that I knew of because, you know, having been born and raised there, I knew what my options were. And I thought, this isn't, this isn't good enough. I want something more. I want something with more going on that has more diverse experiences. And so I started looking and did the same kind of radius, gave myself Mm -hmm. a radius around Pittsburgh so I can still get back home to family if I want. But I also really wanted a bigger city. Um, Pittsburgh is a really, really great place to grow up and be raised. And I have a lot of friends who have moved away since moved back. They're raising their own families. But for me, it was just a little bit, everyone knows everyone's business. And yeah. so I wanted to get out of that <laughs> Small a little town-ish. bit. Small town city. Yeah. Um, so I started looking and I looked at places like Kennedy Krieger down here. That's, a, you know, associated with Johns Hopkins. They have a okay. wonderful program. Started looking at school systems down here and I found St. Coletta of Greater Washington. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm very familiar with that. That's been maybe a decade or and I have been there because I remember what it was prior to being built there in a mm-hmm. beautiful building. Right now, oh, that building is beautiful. Yes. Beautiful on the outside. Um, I'd say on the inside, I know they're in the process of trying to rework uh, it to make it fit. Gotcha. All the, you know, every education system, right? We're running out of space for all these kids. Oh, yeah. So I know there, I have friends who still work there and they're saying, okay, I think we're going to rework parts of the building. Yeah, but yeah. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Okay. Um, complex kids, complex families, complex situations, but gave me the opportunity to learn way more than I think I would have in any other clinical setting. So I had the opportunity to work on a team putting together augmentative and alternative communication for these kids that their bodies really didn't cooperate with their brains the way they wanted them to, right? So if I'm in a wheelchair and I can't access my hands and my voice, how am I going to communicate? Well, I'm going to use eye gaze. And what kind of system is going to pick up where my eyes look and it's going to press a button and it's going to talk for me? Really quick, eye gaze, I'm guessing, is software. Mm-hmm. How long has that, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the technology that assists kids in healthcare of that nature, mm-hmm. something like an eye gaze, how long has that exist? Do you know? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest. Okay. It's It's been developed over the last, I'd say, 20, 25 years, but it's okay. gotten more and more and more advanced, advanced I'm to sure. this. So, you know, it, it used to be really hard to calibrate. Um, They're getting more and more accurate. It's still a really draining way to communicate if you have to imagine looking at a screen all day, especially if, um, let's say, you have other things going on in your body that may already be exhausting it. This is an added layer. So, you know, my goal is always to provide the most effective and efficient mode of communication for these kids. Um, But I loved it. I love that's what I did. But I was working with uh, teams of physical therapists and occupational therapists and assistive technology professionals and found myself starting to notice things about how they were accessing it or how they were sitting in their wheelchair. And, you know, me being 23 and no makeup and a ponytail, who's going to listen to me whenever I have something to say about something that's outside of my field, right? So I went and got an additional certification, ended up doing an online course, again, through Pitt, just because they are really big into the rehab engineering Okay. side of things. Um, there's a couple of programs now that are getting more and more into that, but there's not anything that's really uh, from our national board that recognizes that kind of skill set for working with these kinds of individuals. So you have to go outside of it. Um, but I became an assistive technology professional and I thought that's what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm going to work with these complex kids and help them communicate. Um, but then, you know, life throws Happens. curveballs. And so I ended up needing to move back to Pittsburgh for some family things that were going on, got put in this outpatient setting in a hospital and was like, wow, this is awful. I hate this. You know, I'm working with people who viewed communication challenges much differently than I do. So mm-hmm. I had, um, you know, women I worked alongside with who would say, well, he or she isn't ready for speech therapy because they mm-hmm. have a whole bunch of behaviors. And I looked at that oh. as they have behaviors because they're can't communicate. Struggling with communication. It's your role as the clinician to 
make that better for them. That's the exchange, because communication, if that's the exchange or imparting of information, Mm -hmm. if that's initially a basic human function, Mm -hmm. that itself can be extremely frustrating because just within yourself, just imagine us as adults being misunderstood in our regular conversations, which Mm -hmm. can can be misunderstood, can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. So for a child with developmental difficulties, Mm -hmm. that's got to be compounded. So I often consider those people that have been in any kind of industry for a long time, Mm -hmm. like you just met them, they say, they're not ready. I, I see you getting out of that and saying this is not for me because you're you're too negative. You're not very insightful or optimistic about the changes. Did you share your views and what about the possibilities or encouraging to look in a different direction? Or how did you handle that? That's very interesting. Yeah, um, I'd say you know over the years between either being a clinical supervisor or supervising others, from my experience, people learn best by watching and seeing okay. it done. Um, yes. You can tell, you know, you can lead a horse to water, right? You can you tell make people them drink. How, to, how it's going to work. You can send them research articles. You can do all these things. Um, but at, people will often buy in if they can see it, gotcha. if they can see the success. And so there I was, you know, everyone else is in their slacks and their dress pants sitting at their little table. I'm kicking off my flats. <laughs> I have stretchy pants on and I'm reeling kids <laughs> up and down the hallway on a yeah. scooter trying to get them to work on fast and slow and stop and go. Wow. And they were... So interactive. They were like, wow. that, And I, you know, I'm just trying to sit there and say, look, you can do this differently. Yes. Speech therapy is not just sitting at a table working on sounds. Oh, yeah. It's using your body. It's communicating for a bunch of different reasons. It's getting these kids in. So I found a way to make that place work for me um, as best as possible, but it still felt very uh, siloed. And that's one of my big problems, I'd say. And that's kind of carrying through to why I ended up with bumblebees, because a lot of times, you know, if you think of yourself, if you go into the doctor's office and maybe they say, okay, well, listen, I need information from this other specialist. Yes. You as the patient has to, you know, go find that information, schedule that appointment, get that information, make sure they communicate that information to your doctor. All of this stuff falls on the patient. Um, It's a lot of clinical heavy stuff that falls on the patient. And whenever you're in a any state of crisis, you're not feeling well. Yes. <laughs> Some system in your body is not working. Putting that on the patient is so, it seems so unfair to me. I was about to right? say the word unfair. Yeah, so it's unfair. Not the, it shouldn't be the responsibility. I can say being involved mm-hmm. in my own healthcare, advocating Important. for myself, but you're trained, you're mm-hmm. learned, you're supposed to be taking on the brunt of this. So I see throughout what you're saying throughout the years, it's changed. It's getting better. Okay. And I'd say in our area, in particular the DMV, I found... Um, you know, five, 10 years ahead of where I was when I was in Pittsburgh. Awesome. It, it was, you know, even though there was, they have this big, massive healthcare system, a couple of them actually, and they do, you know, big changes in different areas. I'm sure they are the specialists and I'm sure they are advancing. But in general, when you step and think I'm a patient going into this system, I should not be my care manager. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, that's not my role. I'm, yeah. I'm the patient. I need someone else who's going to do that. So I was frustrated at all these silos. And when I was in that setting, there were a lot of clinicians who were like, well, I'm an occupational therapist. I work on these, let's say, five things, and this is how I do them. And you can look at my notes if you're interested in how to do that as well. Um, But I'm really, really big on co-treating and working collaboratively and working as a team. And that's something I got from my experience at St. Coletta, was seeing how much progress you can make with kids and with families if you all work together. I mean, more the more eyes, the better. The more brains, the better. Absolutely. So really quick, because you have such a, a network in your own family, mm-hmm. how is your family supportive of you experientially in their own disciplines for you and yours? Or did they just, hey, go ahead, Alex, we're here. You're your family. We love you. But did they um, lend any of their expertise, like for your dad, yeah. who's in pathology, which is the science of the causes and effects of diseases or conditions, how did they lend their expertise or did they? Um, I'd say less of their clinical skills. Okay. Um, more, more of, love, of the, love, more love, 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 love <laughs> lots of familial support. Okay. Um, it's been helpful over the years to bounce ideas off of them, right? They're all in their own little oh, God, field. I so I can that. say, hey, I'm experiencing this in my field. Did this happen to you in your I love field, that. right? That's such a kind of the nucleus of what you're just talking about, what lacks Mm -hmm. in the silos Mm -hmm. of the industry being so compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. What is the, 
like um, kind of like the webbing in the fingers? What is the connector? Mm-hmm. You had that because they loved you. I, I, I pray that that can be transferred to the healthcare industry mm. because more people involved in connecting the information, the more answers we can receive, Absolutely. in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm all for people, you know, not necessarily stepping on toes or sticking fingers in, you know, areas they shouldn't be, but yes. by saying, hey, I'm looking at this area, it overlaps with yours. Let's talk about yes. it. Right. It's a lot of overlapping. Absolutely. And additionally, if you think of, you know, when it comes to therapies, they're very time consuming. Yes. Physical therapy, occupational therapy. You know, we've all probably at some point been to a PT for yes. some injury and you're like, oh man, I got to go every Tuesday or whatever the day is. And you're dragging your butt there yes, and yes, the whole time. And then so they say, do you do your these? Go. Yep. And they're like, go home and do your exercises. And you're like, no, I don't have time to do this. Right. And so you're looking for Are other. Are reading something for my file? <laughs> I had PT in January, and I will not name my PT. God forbid he hears this, but yeah. he'll, he knows I didn't do what yeah. I was supposed to be doing every day, right? And so, you know, finding ways that you can overlap that as much as possible. Okay. So if I'm doing speech therapy and my child is sitting, but they're just as stable standing, and it's not too exhausting to distract them, that I'm going to work on crossing midline and I'm going to work on, you know, any of the skills that the OT and PTs would be working on because we can do them at the same time. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I All I heard was like when you said stick, stepping on toes, I think a lot of times in any industry, what has to be laid aside is just the ego. Lay down the ego, know what the focus is, know what the end game is, and everybody wins. It's a win-win mm-hmm. situation. I really want to jump into what you talked about, your specific clinical approaches, mm-hmm. and number one, play-based. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You have here a quote from um, Mr. Rogers, who everyone knows or I hope should know. Um, <laughs> play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is a serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. Therapy is most successful when delivered in a play-based, naturalistic way. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love. I, I think that it relieves the stress mm-hmm. of learning because I was raised in the public school system and it's just like work, 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 work. And a lot of times, just as a sidebar, a lot of the creative parts were removed from the public school system when they didn't consider that as an ad. That that sparks motivation. Mm-hmm. It really motivates in a place. So can you speak to that in your um, approaches with your yeah. students? I actually love that you said motivation because so much of when it comes to any kind of therapy, we want that child to be internally motivated Absolutely. as soon as possible. Yes. It's way more motivating for me to want to do this than mom and dad. Yes. Or grandma to be telling me that I have to do this. <laughs> so we absolutely want to get that motivation in there. But the Play really is the basis for all of these things. So when you think about, you know, taking your toy and walking it up a tree or walking it up a hill, doing something with your toy, all of those kinds of movements, there's fine motor movements, there's gross motor movements, you're working on imitation, you're adding in environmental sounds. Maybe my cow's going moo, moo, moo up the (laughs) hill, right? There's so many things happening. Yes. And they teach, there's really the building blocks. I mean, I have to, often when I work with early intervention families who are really hyper-focused on, you know, my 18-month-old, my my two-year-old isn't talking yet. And I say, I hear you and your concerns are so valid, but let's back up. Do they have these building blocks? Do we have a, a long enough attention span to really engage with other people? Do we have joint attention? Am I, you know, looking at you and looking at my toy and looking back? Am I initiating things with you? Am I imitating your body movements? Okay. A lot of the um, things that we all experienced, such as, you know, like nursery rhymes. Think of, yes. you know, singing that Wheels on the Bus song. Yeah. You're moving your hands in a circle. You're moving them side to side, right? right? <laughs> Around. Yes. All of that is actually teaching us the early skills. We Absolutely. just didn't know it. Right. So even before you could sing the song, you're moving your hands in yes. the circle. Yes. Because developmentally, those things happen before the speech happens. It's like on j- on the job training. Yeah. You're just doing it. Yeah. Can we jump to the second P, which is prompt? Mm-hmm. Prompts for restructuring oral muscular phonetic targets. Mm. Yeah, fancy way. <laughs> Fancy way of saying we're going to help your mouth move the way you want it to. Okay. Um, There is something called childhood apraxia of speech, and it basically means that the child wants to make a certain sound, wants to say a certain word, but there's a disconnect between their mouth movements and their brain. So they're trying to plan and program and execute a movement, but it doesn't always come out the way they want it to. So 
for these kiddos, they really benefit from getting a restructuring of those motor movements. And so that technique is really hands-on. You're really touching someone's face. Oh, wow. Um, and helping stabilize things that maybe aren't stable, giving touch cues on parts of their mouth so that they know what parts of the muscle to activate. It's okay. really, really helpful. Okay, I want to go back to just describing who your target is. Mm-hmm. It says that, um, of course, you're based in, in D.C. for children 18 months to 18 years mm-hmm. with communication challenges. So can you just speak to the differences? Because you've been working in Bumblebee how, how long? The practice opened in January of 2022. Okay, so if I'm thinking like some centers, I'm not too well-versed in how the healthcare process works and delivering services mm-hmm. to school students. Because I'm thinking if you start at 18 months before a young age, by the time you get to 18, you've made some progresses. But I would like to know that if you get a adolescent or teenager, have you experienced that? And is it is it more challenging that, that they're in an older age group? It depends on what they're coming in for. Okay. I'm, I'm smiling and laughing because there's definitely times where I get a nine-year-old, an 11-year-old who maybe had speech when they were younger, but their R's still aren't the way they want it to be. Or maybe we're having some difficulties with reading comprehension. Something's coming up, right? And they just don't want to be there. They're over it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we talked about that internal motivation. And for them, that's the most important part for me. Um, so a lot of times for those kids, I actually put them in the driver's seat much sooner than I think other clinicians do. Okay. Um, they have been told what to do. You know, you got to go to speech. You got to work on this sound. Let's go. Let's yes. fix it. Yes. And, or, you know, you got to go to speech. You got to work on this language concept. And I say, you know, what do you think about your speech? Great. Oh, my goodness. On a scale of Great one to ten. Approach. What do you think? Yeah. And then more importantly, what do you think mom and dad think? Okay. And then and I said, what do you think your friends think? And how much do you want to change it? How much do you think they want to change it? And I get them starting to really think about it. And it's really, really good data, not only for me to know where they're at in the process, but also with these families who, to some degrees, you know, when you've had a child in therapy for a while, or maybe if something's an ongoing issue, you, you kind of are going through the movement yes. motions, right? I'm, I'm just going through the motions. I'm taking them to soccer every week, taking them to speech every yes. week, things like that. Yes. But for these ones, we got to flip it and get them reengaged. And oh, so absolutely. when that child sees the benefit in it and, and can get some buy-in, then, I mean, they can make insanely fast progress. I had a little girl just this year who knocked out her R's in about four months. Whereas, you know, you could have a kid work on that for years if they're not invested. Okay. Um, so it depends on what they're coming in for. I've also in different roles and different jobs in the past have worked with kids who are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Maybe they're still in the school system because they have a developmental disability before they age out completely. They can be challenging because there's a lot of people that came before me. Yeah. And there's a lot of feelings that they have yeah. around clinicians in their life. And oh, so yeah. getting to build that trust and getting to build, again, that buy-in from them, but also the families. Um, I've had some families come with older kids who, you know, I, I do have to be that person that has the hard conversations that says, what are we going to do next? Okay. We have to start thinking about that. Okay. I know you don't want to, but we need to think what's our end game? What is our long-term goals? How can we help your child be as successful and confident in their communication, you know, and, and be as independent as possible. Yeah, I see that you you give parents the confidence they need to support their child because we as parents, we want the, uh, the absolute best mm-hmm. for our children. And it can be frustrating because we don't know. And as I spoke with your peers, um, uh, sorry, I've, with more Learning, mm-hmm. Chloe and Chanel mm-hmm. of um, Speech Boutique, mm-hmm. the, I hate to say the word, but the rigmarole of every day doing it over yeah. and over and over again. You guys are the superheroes because you um, give us more building blocks for the foundation for mm-hmm. why we do this because life can get tedious. Life can get draining. And if we're, and especially if we have to enforce it and uh, build upon it. And if we don't have the skills, mm-hmm. we could try sometimes, unfortunately, not that we want to lay it aside and just make you the everything to them. Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah, and that's, I understand it, but it keeping them engaged and motivated uh, is, is most beneficial for parents and families. But I really want to thank you for everything that you do for families because it's, it's much needed. So continuing with LAMP, mm-hmm. Language Acquisition Motor Planning. Mm-hmm. You said this is a therapeutic approach based on neurological and motor learning principles. And I know that during our conversation, we may like jump back and forth into something okay. that you've already explained. Yeah. Um, it says to help children who are nonverbal or have limited verbal abilities. I, I would like to say, first of all, 
Even though my granddaughter is seven, when I did Zoom school with her during the pandemic, when I was listening to her, like a little tiny twinge of fear, like, I think you should be reading a little bit more. I'm just listening, knowing her mom is, of course, mm-hmm. her parents are with her more. So when I would come in, I'm just like, maybe, but now, and I wanted to also speak to that as a sidebar, how do you, how do you define whether or not they just haven't hit it yet, hit their peak yet? Because from that feeling that I had during the pandemic to now, I'm just like the... um. <laughs> The hooked on fondness conversation yeah. commercial, like, okay, now stop using such big words. Yeah. Use something grandma can understand. So that part about how yeah. do you know they just haven't hit their learning peak yet, mm-hmm. but also speaking to, of course, I want to go back to lamp. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's um that's kind of the the art of it. Um there's always I the science that, of it, the right? Art, yes. You know, you can look at a standardized test, which is some sort of test that's been given to a whole bunch of kids yes. and we say, Okay, at this Statistics. age, yep, they should be doing this. And a lot of times, um, you know, I'll tell you that like school systems rely on that to be able to identify a child as a need. Um, yeah. There's other ways, of course, but a lot of times that's a, kind of a cutoff point. It's okay, do they meet this score? Are they this far from this many standard deviations from the average? Yes. Um, but the benefit of private practice is that your child could, on a standardized test, look completely normal. I have a handful of kids on my caseload right now that when you come and sit in a room with just me, you looks completely different than when you're out in the real world and interacting with other people, right? It's a whole different ballgame then. Um, and so it's a, it's this art, I think, where you recognize what does this child have as far as current skills? When I interact with them, what is their learning style? Okay. What kind of family support do they have? What, you know, should we expect as far as involvement? Are mom and dad, you know, are they both working two jobs right now? Do they have way too much going on? Yes. Is this the boost that they need right now? Because mom and dad can't give that and not because they don't want to, but just yeah, because, you know, life. Yeah, dedication. And it's a lot. Um, and so I, I think finding that balance of using the standardized scores, but also using all of these observations and, and really looking at that child situation. Yeah, it's not, not, not either or, it's both it's, and. There's like very the few things that are black and white in my world. Thank it you. is gray. I live in a gray land. I love it because <laughs> it, it doesn't dismiss the other. No. I love that. No. It just, it includes, it's very inclusive yeah. of all, everyone's talents and everyone's trainings. It doesn't mean that you, you go into this office, you sit down, close the door, mm-hmm open another door, another office. It's just like a hotel room. There's a connecting door. It all goes all together. Of the, all of these things are and together. And it matters, you know, a, a, no child is going to look the same day to day. And we don't look the same, right? Like yesterday was an awful day for me. Not yes. e- not because anything was really wrong. It was just one of those, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Yes. By the end of the day, it was great. Saw Leon Bridges last night. We had a great time. Good. And, mm-hmm. and, you, and you say no one clinical approach mm-hmm. is going to fit a kid every time. And I love that. It's very, it's very specialized. And um, it gives the child the freedom to know I'm not competing in a, against another child. Mm-hmm. I'm competing against me and whatever's going on with me. Mm-hmm. Because as adults in the world that we live in, it's just like, it's kind of structured here, in my opinion, that we're competing against the person sitting next to Always. us. Always. And it just make help me to become the best me mm-hmm. that's possible. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was so, something, you know, we touched on earlier too, yes. with that idea of like, very collaborative yes. and something that, you know, it just happens to be a topic that keeps coming up in my world lately for a variety of different reasons and different parts of my life right now. But that idea of, you know, what's that old saying? The rising tide raises all ships. Yes, it right? takes like, a village. Like it, it really lifting up other people yes. really is the way to go Absolutely. versus trying to climb win, and be on win. top. Yeah. Um, but with all these approaches, right, I list them on, on the on the website because there are people out there who've done their own research and say, my child has this going on and I need this approach. Or, or I, I, met, I met a doctor who said, I need to find someone who's trained in this. And it's absolutely valid and important. Um, but with all of these things, I mean, we mix and match them. And it is one thing within the realm of speech pathology that you don't really see as much in occupational therapy and physical therapy, but they're are um, a lot of these name brand trainings. And I think that a lot of it is research-based and it's fantastic, but there's a decent portion of it where, you know, if you go to these trainings, you sit down and you are, you are there for the cruise ship sale, right? Like they are, they are trying to, they are like, this is the be all and the only thing that's going to work. Yeah, this is it. (laughs) You, you, this is the only way. And, and why I include them is like I said, people want to know that you're trained in it, but really taking a piece from all of it is how you 
build the best treatment plan. You can't just go in and say, we're going to do this one approach. Yes. And I love it where you have music therapy. And I am so oh my, excited. I can just imagine Andrew and I are just like tingling because we <laughs> love music. So it says Bumblebee Pediatric Therapy is now offering music therapy group sessions on select weekends throughout the year. So can you just touch upon that? Oh, because this is I am so excited to be able to offer this. I mean, we need an extra 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, one of the things I um we haven't really been able to touch on too much yet is the kind of my end game, right? Bumblebee was started this year, but this is not obviously not my first year practicing. Taking all these experiences that got me to this point, you okay. know, we talked a little bit about the siloed aspect of medicine and how I really want to create a space that I am referring to that's within my own system. Yes. I was frustrated by the school systems, worked in a whole bunch of them, frustrated by different healthcare systems. Yes. And so I thought, you know what? Like, can I make my own smaller system where if you're coming in and I see something that's maybe outside of my scope, I can refer you in-house. You know, not because I'm trying to take over the therapy world, but because I know that this, you know, this person is trained and I trust them and you're going to be a great fit. Yes. Um, and music therapy is kind of my first step in that direction. Um, it is so beneficial to every every kid, everyone, anyone everyone. can benefit from it. But um, I see it for my kids with speech sound disorders because music activates a different part of our oh brain. Oh my God. Right? It's, it's, it's a different the inspiration area. inspiration of mm -hmm. it all. And it is, it's a release it's a for release. everyone. You don't have to be a an artist, you, it could be humming, it yeah. could be any any form of music. Yeah. And in the same way we were talking about the wheels on the bus song earlier, yes. all of those movements that you go to a music class for yes. are or great. Incorporated. Right, are incorporated. And I found the most amazing music therapist, um, Jo Pittman. She actually yes. works at a school in the area as well. And so this is going to be, I'm kind of stealing a little bit of her time on the weekends, whatever she can cool. give me, because, um, you know, when you find a board certified music therapist, as opposed to music teacher, they come with a deeper understanding okay. of development and how a child's development can be impacted by music. Okay. And she's actually attended a lot of the same trainings I have. You know, it's uh, so she's coming in with this much broader and yet somehow deeper understanding of child development outside of uh, maybe a more traditional music class that's available. Okay, awesome. So I, I we literally could extend this podcast <laughs> for another thirty minutes. Um, I want to thank you so much for thank your you. time. I want to thank you for your expertise and then the music therapy, adding another person to the piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. to, to best serve the community and to serve our children, mm -hmm. to give them the best um, launching pad that they can get. So once again, this is Alex Kohler at BumblebeePediatrics.com. On her website, you can find anything. You can find the list of the also the other counselors and um, her community that she has that's working with her. Her number here is 202. 384-6594 and she's on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. So um, if these services are something that you and your family need, please check out Bumblebee Pediatrics. Alex Kohler has a network that will greatly be able to service your family. Um, so once again, thank you so much for uh, being a guest here and we'll see you again next time on The Hub Podcast sponsored by Capital Workspaces. Thank you. Thank you.